Galatians 3. So if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to turn there. Galatians 3, verses 1 through 6. This message is entitled, The Folly of Forgotten Faith. The Folly of Forgotten Faith. Galatians 3, verse, verses 1 through 6. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if, in, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. On October 12, 2019, Eliud Kipuchek finished a marathon in one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. It was the first time in history that a marathon was finished under two hours. What does it take? What does it take to run a race like this? It takes a perfect race. You can't have one lousy mile in order for you to be able to finish a marathon in under two hours. Have you ever tried to run a mile? How's your mile time? Six minutes. Two hours. Two hours. Six minutes. Well, I can do a mile in one minute in the car. Oh, yeah. Eliud's time, four minutes, 33 seconds, average per mile. I, I will never see that time, even in a 100-meter sprint. It takes a perfect race to run a marathon under two hours. Have you ever tried? We don't handwrite anything anymore, right? But have you ever tried handwriting a letter? You know, you start and, and your calligraphy is all there, right? And your letters look so beautiful, nice shaped, and as your hand gets tired and your writing starts getting sloppy and the way you begun yeah, mm -hmm. It looks nothing like the way you finished. Mm -hmm. Friends, what about our spiritual life? How did we begin our spiritual life? How, how were we doing when we began? Was our faith strong? How are we doing today? Did we see when we came to Christ? Did we see significant victory over sin? Over besetting sin? Uh, were you able to forsake that sin, that sin that, so, that clings so closely, how are you doing, how are you doing fighting besetting sin today? Well, Galatians helps us because Paul is here speaking to a group of believers that began well. They, they had begun the race well, but they were strange. To a point that Paul says, perhaps all of this has been in vain. And what does Paul indict the, the Galatians with? Not that they were not disciplined. Not that they didn't read their Bible often enough. Not that they didn't attend church often enough. It was not their religious practices that he was indicting them for. It was their lack of faith. It was the fact that they began by faith, but now they were seeking to be perfected by the by work. One of the greatest signs of Christian maturity is an understand that faith is not only the means to salvation, but that faith is also the means to sanctification. God does not abandon us once He redeems us. As a matter of fact, God is with us throughout our entire Christian experience. He would never leave us nor forsake us. That's the promise. Faith plays an integral part in the life of the Christian day in and day out. Romans 14, 23. For whatever does not proceed from faith 
is sin. Well, the opposite is also true, right? Anything that proceeds from faith is righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, not only are we saved by faith, but we walk by faith and not by sight. <coughs> Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And then Hebrews 11 goes on to explain how Abel, Abraham, Moses went on to not only receive God by faith, but accomplish all the things that they accomplished by faith. The letter to the Galatians is one of Paul's earliest letters, perhaps his earliest letter, um, perhaps not earlier than the letters to the Thessalonians, but quite an early letter. This letter was, uh, the, the churches in Galatians were established by Paul before his first missionary journey around chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Acts. And around the time of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, Paul pens this letter to these churches that he had established, that he had established on the gospel, but churches that had veered back to the law. They had received the gospel with faith, but were being influenced by Judaizers. These Judaizers would say, yes, Jesus is good. You should have Jesus. But you must add to Jesus. That's the base of every false religion. You must add to Jesus the works of the law. Paul in this letter greets the Galatians, but he has no time for thanksgiving. This is the only letter that Paul does not express his thanksgiving for a church or for a group of churches. Instead, Paul goes on to immediately pronounce a strong condemnation for those seeking to add work to Christ. For those saying, Christ is good, but He's not enough. Christ is good, but you need to add to the work of Christ in order to have a sure and secure foundation, a salvation. So today we're going to consider three things from our text. We're going to consider first salvation accomplished. And then we're going to consider salvation applied. And then finally we're going to consider the means of salvation. So salvation accomplished. Paul begins with these strong words, O foolish Galatians, who has placed an evil eye on you, literally, who has bewitched you, who has caused your mind to be hypnotized by lies. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul says, foolish. Why? Because they are thoughtless. They have not considered the gospel and all of its implications. Do you not think about what you're doing? Do you not think about the message that has saved you? Paul literally says that a spell has been cast on them, an evil eye. They're confused by the work of the devil. And he says, here's what you forgot. Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified before you. Why the emphasis on the crucifixion? Because as Jesus expires his life on the cross, he cries out, it is finished. It is accomplished. The cross is a reminder to us that there is nothing left for us to do. That we do not work for our salvation. And if the Spirit is not working in us by faith, no good works will amount to righteousness before God. Why? Because it's accomplished. Because it is all finished. Now, it's interesting. The Galatians were not in Jerusalem when Christ was crucified. But Paul says that Christ was portrayed as crucified before you. How so? 
Well, through the preaching of the word. Christ is portrayed as crucified before the Galatians because they hear the essence of Pauline preaching. The essence of Paul's preaching. 1 Corinthians 1.23, if Paul was to give a summary of his preaching, he would say, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 2 verse 2, for I decided, I'm sorry, that's 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Friends, the content of Christian preaching is a cross of Christ at the heart of every Christian message. There must be a cross that a preacher points the listeners to. Just as the Galatians saw portrayed, Christ portrayed as crucified before him, today Christ is being portrayed as crucified before you through the same apostolic preaching base of apostolic scriptures that we have in front of us. So the Galatians had no excuse to reject the finished work of Christ. Likewise, we have no excuse to reject the finished work of Christ. Christ's work was finished because it was perfect, perfectly obeyed the law, so his sacrifice, unlike every other sacrifice ever presented, was perfect. And friends, anything that is added to perfection takes away from perfection. I mean, think about this. Have you ever driven around and noticed nice cars, Ferraris, Maseratis, and you name it? The beautiful cars, right? They're perfect in and of themselves. You know what? You never see one of those cars? A bumper sticker. <laughs> you notice that? You don't need a bumper sticker to make a Ferrari special. Why? Because the value is in itself. Why do we think that we need to add our filthy rags to the work of Christ in order to be made right before God? Is it not perfect? Then what is it lacking? Is it not finished? Then why should we try to finish it? Christ, when He offered Himself for us, He offered perfection. And we dare not try to alter the perfection that He's added, that He's given to us. Anything that is added to perfection steals it of its glory. This is why it's, this letter is such a big deal. It's not that the Galatians were saying, look, I believe Christ, I'm just going to add a few things to Him just to be saved. Kind of like what you do in a grocery store, right? You grab a few of these things, you grab a few of these things, and you put all these things just to be safe in your cart. No, 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 no. No, there's a big problem when we say Jesus' work is not finished, Jesus' work is not enough, I need more. We're stealing glory from the one who is worthy of glory. What are some ways that we ourselves rely on our works rather than on the finished <coughs> sacrifice of Christ? Do you think too highly of your ability to do and to be good? Do you think that God deals with you according to how little you sin or according to how disciplined you are? Do you think that God is pleased with you according to how Christian you are? I remember one day talking to a friend and my friend asked me, Lucas, do you think that God is more pleased with you the days that you do your devotional rather than the days that you skip your devotional? And I said, of course. And he said, you haven't understood the gospel yet. God is not pleased with us based on our disciplines. God is not pleased with us based on what we do for Him. God is pleased with us based on what Christ has done for us. It is His righteousness that He sees. It is that that He accepts. It is that that He sees good, says is good. And anything we add to that, He says, foolish. That's folly. I'm not speaking against Christian 
discipline. I believe in Christian discipline. I seek to live a discipline like myself. But it is not the basis that I relate to God in. Do you think of yourself as a better person than others? Do you look around and say, well, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like the tax collector. <laughs> Do you think of yourself as better than other Christians? You know, these people that go to this church, you know, they believe strange things, but I don't. God must be pleased with that. Do you think God answers your prayers according to how little you sin or how much good you do? Friends, these very things rob Christ of His glory on the cross. Rob Christ of the glory that he accomplished for himself and for us. God is not pleased when we try to steal his glory. Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. But not only did Jesus accomplish salvation, friends, this is the good news of the gospel. This is the heart of the gospel, okay? Not only did Jesus accomplish salvation on the cross, he also applied it. Applied it to us. In other words, he took the credit that he received and he put it in our name. Our bank account was totally broken. And suddenly, it is filled with riches from heaven. How? That which is Christ. Christ's applied to us. In the following verses, verses 2 and 3 and 4, we're going to see a series of rhetorical questions. Uh, uh, rhetorical questions are questions designed to instruct. And they're obvious. Their answer is assumed. Most people understanding the context would assume the right answer. They pit faith and works against each other. They pit the work of the Spirit and the work of the flesh against each other. And, and Paul's goal here is, say, is, is to say, don't be so foolish to think that you are now walking apart from the Spirit, apart from the faith that introduced you to Christ. So he says in verse 2, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by words of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, the answer is obvious. How is the Spirit given? The Spirit is given by faith. The Spirit is what applies the salvation that Christ accomplished to us. Okay? So here's how salvation works. Have you ever heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Here's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. God gives you grace in Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes into you and regenerates you. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. The Bible says that there's one baptism, and that's what it is. The baptism then ought to be followed up publicly, public profession of faith, right, uh, by immersion, affirming the gospel. Yes. But there's one baptism. It is the application of God's redemptive work through Christ in us when the Spirit gives us life. When does that happen? Ephesians 2, right? When we're dead in our trespasses and our sin. God made us alive in Christ. The Spirit takes the work of Christ and applies it to us. How does He do that? By faith. That's conversion, that's redemption. That's what often is referred to as salvation, although salvation is an umbrella term. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Here's the heart of his argument. He's saying, were you saved by works? No, of course not, Paul. Then if you were not saved by works, but you saved by faith, why do you think that now you must walk by works? God doesn't work only in the beginning of our Christian walk and then leaves us alone. He's actively involved with our salvation from beginning to end. 
Philippians 1, 6, right? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Who works? It is God who works in us. We do not become spiritual orphans once we become saved. We are saved by faith and we pursue our sanctification by faith. One of the most important steps towards Christian maturity is when a Christian understands that the gospel is not just for the unbeliever, but it is for the believer. The gospel is not only for salvation, but it is for sanctification. The gospel is not only for the start of the race, but for the whole of the Christian life. Listen to these verses from Paul's writing and from Hebrews about the application of the gospel to sanctification. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to work and both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Who is working out our salvation in us? We are. But it is God who works in us primarily at the will level, at the desire level, at the heart level. Did you hear that? He works both to will and to work. So if we ever do anything good, why do we do it? Because God works in our hearts. Because God caused us to see His wondrous glory and caused us to desire to live for that. Colossians 1.29, for this, Paul says, I toil, struggling with all His energy, that He powerfully works within me. What is this? The work of the Spirit. I work, why? Because I have the Spirit of God in me. Do you see how now, now there's no glory left here for Paul, right? Because if the Spirit does not supply the energy, He won't be able to work. That's the point. This understanding of faith for sanctification is what kills Christian pride. And it is what glorifies Christ. Titus 2, 11 and 12, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Training. Training aspect of grace. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So why, why do we have victory over sin? Paul would say because of grace. Because God so graciously worked in us that His grace is training us to live like Christ. Friends, there's no room for pride in the Christian life. There's no room for looking at others and say, I am where I am because of what I've done. Mm -hmm. I am where I am because of what Christ has done. And if it was left up to me, I would be headed the opposite direction. <clears throat> That's the Christian, Christian message. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus. Why should we look to Jesus? Because He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Do, do you realize how radical this statement is? The faith that is required to walk the Christian walk is authored, founded by Christ. And it is perfected by Christ. Paul goes on in verse 4 to say, Did you suffer so many things in vain? In vain, If indeed was in vain. So Paul is calling to question here, Did you, 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 you lost possessions, you lost relationships, you lost so much to become a Christian. Was all this in vain? And the truth is that it's never in vain to forsake all things and follow Christ. So Paul is really here saying, return to the gospel. If you forsake the gospel, everything you suffer would be in vain. But here's what Christians do when they hear the gospel. Okay? When Christians hear the gospel, they say, that's right, that's true. I keep forgetting. You know that hymn that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Take my heart. They can seal it 
seal it for thy, thy courts above. That's, that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, don't forsake the gospel. Your everything that you've invested, don't forsake all that. And when Christians hear that, right? When Christians hear that, they say that is true. We need to be reminded of the gospel day in and day out. So, friends, here's what I want you to understand today. This message to the Galatians is a message to you. In what ways have you forgotten the gospel? In what ways are you trying to walk your Christian life today apart from the Spirit? In what ways are you saying, I can accomplish this? I can do this. In what ways are you looking at everything around you and thinking, these things depend on me rather than on the grace of God? In what ways have you forgotten the holiness that the Spirit provides is necessary, paramount. Without holiness, we will not see God. In what ways have you forgotten that our entire lives, whether we eat or we drink, whatever we do, we must do everything for the glory of God? In what ways have you forgotten these things? How do you fix that? We go back to the gospel. We go back to the gospel so that we can overcome besetting sins so that we can overcome faithlessness. You know, very often, right? I don't know if you've done this. I, I often feel tempted to do this. I did this a lot as a kid. You Something difficult in your life happens and you make a promise to God. God, I'll never do fill in the blank again. Friends, that shows such an unbelieving heart. Considering that God is working with us according to what we do and what we don't do? No, friends. That's not how God works. Do not make promises to God. The promises that you have are the promises from God. Instead, preach the gospel to yourself and allow that gospel to transform you. Allow that love for Christ to change you. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the message that God, the creator of the universe, made this world beautiful, true, perfect. And we, in our first father Adam, we ruined it. We had a whole, a whole world to enjoy, but the one thing that God said, not that, that's the very thing that in Adam we pursued. Sin entered the world and corrupted this beautiful world. Corrupted this holy world. Our relationship with God was severed. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Your sins have made a separation between you and your God. That's the big problem that we have. We're born in our trespasses and our sins. We fall short of the glory of God. We rebel. We transgress His law. We do not love God by nature. It's bad news. The gospel is good news. Because God did not wait for us to get our acts together or to become holy in order to save us. God instead intervened, interposed His precious blood, came as a man in Jesus Christ. I told the church this Sunday morning, we often think that the gospel is Jesus' death for us. The gospel is Jesus' life for us. Yes, the death. But it is Jesus' perfect lived life that He offers. And He says, this can be yours. My perfect obedience can be yours. The cross plays a role too. The cross is the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection plays a role too. Jesus rises. And with that power we live today because He rises in the sense to the right hand of the Father and sends us the Spirit so that we don't have to live in our flesh. We can live in the Spirit. That's the message of the Gospel. Friends, how do you receive it? Paul says, by works of the law or by faith? Receive it with faith. You receive it by believing it. And if that message saved you, it can transform you. It can change you today. If the fact that Jesus died for you is not powerful enough for you to say, well, that means I'm going to forsake the besetting sin that I've been pursuing. Well, if Jesus died for you, and you are the enemy of Christ, is it too hard for you to love your enemies? 
Do, do you see how the gospel motivates us to live holy lives? So friends, we must pursue the gospel as believers. Now, it may be that you're here among us and you've never accepted the gospel. And you've never believed the gospel. Friends, we're not even talking about here living a right Christian life. We're actually talking about here the difference between heaven and hell. And if you have never accepted the gospel, if you've never believed the gospel, may today be the day that you say, I need Jesus' life to be accounted for my life. I need Jesus' death to pay for my sin. I need Jesus' spirit to live within me. And I need all that right now. The Bible says, tomorrow is not guaranteed. Today is the day of salvation. So friends, do not reject the gospel today. Accept it. Believe Jesus Christ. Finally, briefly I'll mention the means of salvation. Paul says in verse 5, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Friends, the law had a beginning. The law began with Moses. And it had an end. It is Christ. But God promises to impute the righteousness of faith, his promise of imputation of righteousness by faith was his plan from the very beginning and will continue to be until the end. How was Abraham justified? By faith. How are we to be justified? By faith. You know, there's this uh, TV series, it's largely good, but sometimes it's not. Every time we try to extrapolate on the Bible, often we miss the point. Uh, it's called The Chosen. It's good, but recently The Chosen has, Jesus made the statement, I am the law of Moses. Well, that's not true. That is not true. John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see the dichotomy there? Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 45, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Christ is the end of the law. I am not saying here that therefore there is no law. Absolutely not. Christ becomes the prism through which the law, through which the law comes. And we are now viewing the law rather than black and white. We are viewing the law in full colors. Why? Because we have the Spirit in us. That's the promise of the new covenant. Isn't it? I will write my law in your hearts. But, but, never in order to save ourselves or to please God through these works, but instead, because we love God, we obey His commandments. Jesus accomplished the law on our behalf so we could be righteous, not by works, but by faith. So friends, let us walk by faith because Jesus did that which we could never do. What is that? Perfectly obey the law. So that we could have that which we could never do righteousness. So may this message not only affect the way we come to faith, but by the way, but the way also that we walk by faith. Would you pray with me? Father, help us have a big picture of the gospel. May we not think of the gospel as the entry way to Christianity, but the whole of Christianity. We need to remember that Christ was crucified for us. We need that today, we'll need that tomorrow, or we'll need this reminder forever. Help us live by faith, not by sight. Help us not rely on our works, but on the works, finished work of Christ. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.